Flips it to the end zone. Caught. Touchdown. Marvin Harrison Jr. making a huge impact. Here's Edwards with the lay. Donovan Edwards down the sideline. Catch pass ransom. Donovan Edwards. Touchdown, Michigan. This is the CFF Sites Week 11 College Fantasy Football Show. My name is Joe DeSalvo, the voice of the CFF site, and that's right. Week 11 is in the books. Week 12, right around the corner, semifinal week of College Fantasy Football Leagues, and that only means one thing. If you play in a head-to-head format, almost every league is in the playoffs starting this week. So every decision, every roster decision that you make from this point on uh, can make a break you. And, and this is what I say. This is the most important week on the college fantasy football calendar. And I say it every year for you guys that watch or listen to the podcast because, you know, week 13 is the championship week. You cannot win it unless you get there. And most leagues that went, you know, that there's money involved, you know, most money leagues, this is where the big payoff is first and second place. You've got to win the semifinals to have a shot at winning it. I'm all about going all in on the semifinal week and then just take a chance, put yourself in a position to maybe make some moves if your roster's faced with some difficult matchups in week 13. But week 12 is the season. This is the must-win game of the year if you play in a head-to-head format to put yourself in position to win money. This is the money week and, for me, the most important week of the college fantasy football season for all of you guys that are in the playoffs. We're going to continue to talk college football playoffs. We're going to continue to talk Heisman favorites. I'm going to take questions from the Discord community once again, and we're going to give a shout out to a few guys that are still alive in the four-in-one Super Fantasy League. We are coming down to the wire. There are a number of you guys still left in it, so I'm going to give you a shout out this week. And so let's just start with the college football playoffs right now because I feel like now – Things are a little bit more, uh, you know, clearer than they were a couple of weeks ago. Although now that I said that, we're about to get mayhem. But for me, I've been saying Michigan, Ohio State, Georgia, Florida State for the past couple of weeks, maybe three weeks now. I I don't think anything has really changed, even with that, uh, you know, particularly given that matchup against Michigan, uh, for Michigan against Penn State. I think the only thing it really solidified to me was that Penn State's really not that good. I'm not sold on Drew Aller as a quarterback. I don't think he's ever going to be good enough to beat Michigan or Ohio State. I think they have to find a better quarterback if Penn State's going to find a way to conquer that division of the Big Ten or find a way to conquer Michigan or Ohio State. But Drew Aller is just not it. Hats off to Michigan. Basically went in there, um, you know, uh, bruised Penn State up a little bit. The one thing that I did come away with watching that game is that Penn State at times was able to move the ball on the ground for as one-dimensional as their offense is, and I can't help but how how excited I am thinking about that Ohio State-Michigan game because I really do think that it's a 50-50 matchup. I think Ohio State matches up really well with them defensively, and whenever you have Marvin Harrison uh, and a quarterback that can just get him the ball, you're going to have a chance. And so that Michigan-Ohio State game uh, should be really fun, and uh, you know the big question is whether or not that game will eliminate either of those teams from contention because right now there is sort of a log jam up there. I mean, I'm hearing folks in the media right now questioning Florida State. I I just think right now, as long as they run the table, they have to be in the top four. Uh, Even, you know, with Washington right there on the outside looking in, Washington to me is a team that reminds me of Oklahoma from a few weeks back. They seem to play with fire a little bit. They just haven't gotten burned yet, but I just think it takes one loss for Washington to get bounced out. However, the longer Washington wins, the better it is for Oregon because Oregon can catch them in the Pac-12 championship, knock them down and then really have a you know, have a case for their resume as beating, you know, beating the team that's probably going to be ranked inside the top 5 at the end of the year. For them, you know, a case to make it as a one-loss team. I'm not a big fan of those Pac-12 teams. I just don't think that they stack up really well against a Michigan, Ohio State, or Georgia. But I don't think you're going to convince the media of that. And I think they're going to put one of those teams in, you know, if these other teams trip up. You've got Texas, another team like Oklahoma, I thought would lose to a, a game. They were taken to the wire by Kansas State. 
They got out to a nice lead against TCU. TCU made that a close game. I'm not sold on Texas being a top four team. Let's see what happens if they can run the table and finish with one loss. And then Alabama right now is as hot as anybody with one loss. And we know that Texas beat them at home. I don't think that's the same Alabama team, but I'm still not convinced that Alabama is a top four team right now. I just think Georgia right now is heads and heels above the SEC. I think Florida State, I could say the same thing for them in the ACC. Um, but those are the only eight teams for me that I think have a realistic chance of landing inside of this top four. And I think the interesting thing, the interesting question is what happens to Michigan or Ohio State if they play one another and that happens to be a close game. It's going to be really interesting. I think Florida State runs the table in. Georgia runs the table there in. The winner of Michigan, Ohio State, if they run the table there in, who is the one lost? team that gets in would they take a Michigan or Ohio State with one loss or would they go for a conference champion maybe like Texas or Oregon um, or Washington runs the table and and Ohio State and Michigan lose I, I think Washington then bumps one of those teams out so it'll be interesting to see I, I you kind of get the feel that that the the you know one loss might do Michigan in with everything that they've gotten uh, you know, just the the media of of everything going on with the 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 the, the sign steal and scandal. I don't know. I just Michigan's just one of those top teams in the country. You could see it. Um, I I don't think that's going to have anything to do with or affect them the way that they play or the way moving forward. Michigan's a really good team. Uh, I just worry about Michigan when they play against Ohio State, a Georgia, a team that can really just match them physically. Can they really turn it up? Um, a lot of said uh, said about the interim coach for Michigan. So I guess, you know, I may as well just have a take on that as well. I mean, that guy has gotten beaten up in the media and tons of people have gotten his back as well. I didn't know what I was watching when I was watching him get super emotional. I get that it was emotional. I thought it was a little, I'm just going to say it. I thought it was soft. Um, I, I didn't get it, but um, hats off to him. He did a good job filling in for Harbaugh. And you know what? I think J.J. McCarthy, when I watched those interviews post game, he really won the day on the interview. Uh, the, real good interview, really uh, impressed with what he had to say. But you just got the feeling, you know, watching that interim head coach, listening to Blake Corman, that post game interview, it's really them against the world. They're using that as motivation. Uh, that's fine. Whatever gets them up, right? Whatever works. Uh, and for you Michigan fans, I'm sure there's a lot of you guys that are that are back of them. And for everyone else that's against Michigan, you're know, probably taking their shots. Um, I'm indifferent. I think Michigan's one of the best three teams in the country right now. And I've got no problem with saying that, but I just, I thought I'd mention the interview as well, because it seems to be the talk of the town. And um, quite frankly, I got a, a, a little chuckle out of it because I, I could not figure out why that guy was that emotional. Um, but anyway, hats off to Michigan. Well done. So where does that put us in the Heisman conversation? Because, you know, I've been saying for weeks now that I thought that Michigan's dominance really didn't do any flavors to Blake Corum and J.J. McCarthy. I think McCarthy only threw eight pass attempts in that game against Penn State. They really uh, were, you know, the game was put on the shoulders of the defense and Blake Corum. Blake Corum, a couple of more touchdowns, leads the FBS in touchdowns. One could only imagine how many touchdowns he would have if that defense wasn't so dominant, but look, you can't, you know, coulda, woulda, shoulda, um, you know, he, he's not at that point, you know, Michigan, the season's almost over. And I don't think, you know, Blake Corum may be in the conversation, but certainly he's not worthy of winning the Heisman this year. Um, I just don't think he's done enough. Hasn't hardly had any hundred yard games because they haven't needed him. And I, I don't, you know, same thing for JJ McCarthy, just the volume isn't there. And unfortunately you didn't, you do need that for the Heisman. Now, Let's talk about a name that really I never talked about until this week. I think, Mar you know, because I mentioned Ollie Gordon Jr. was sort of an out. Uh, the second was an outsider. Well, he fell off the map this week with that 20-something yard thud. But Marvin Harrison Jr., I think, has had two or three games in a row now where he's caught a couple of touchdown passes, and he's doing it down the stretch. He's the outsider now, I think, uh, making a move on the field if I had to pick someone that may not have been in the conversation two or three weeks ago that should be included in it now, it would be Marvin Harrison Jr., wide receiver, Ohio State. I still think Jordan Travis has to be in there. I, I don't – I know there's some argument about how tough Florida State uh, – a question, you know, people questioning how tough the matchups have been for Florida State. But Jordan Travis 
Jordan Travis is doing it a little bit with his wide receiver core that was banged up. Um, and they're still undefeated right now. So I still think that he has to get some attention. Michael Penix is going to get some attention. You guys know my thoughts. I've been staying it all year. You know, those zero touchdown performances against Arizona and Arizona State, I didn't think did him any favors. Um, but I think as long as Washington stays undefeated and he has these monster games every couple of weeks with big numbers, his name's going to continue to be mentioned in the Heisman race. I just don't think he would be my winner at all. I think Bo Nix is getting a lot more attention right now than Michael Penix. I think a lot of people feel that Oregon is a better team than Washington if they played on a neutral field uh, in that in that in, you know, and if they get a rematch in a Pac-12 championship. I can see that. I can see making a case for Bo Nix. But for me right now, Jaden Daniels is still number one. And I think Jaden Daniels, you know, I know they lost that game against Alabama and the question about the one loss record. Um, I know he got knocked out of the fourth quarter in that game against Alabama. He probably would have had a little bit better stats had he not. But his numbers are just so crazy. And I'll be honest with you, he makes it look really easy easy right now and that's the one thing that I think about with the Heisman is who is the one player on this list that is just doing it and doing it and doing it and making it look easy and Jaden Daniels just looks heads and tails way better than every other player on the field it seems like when he steps into that uniform and lines up for that LSU offense. Um, he right now, he's my number one. And I know LSU right now, the, the win-loss record, there's a lot of people that would question that. Uh, what he did this past weekend, 300 yards passion, passing, 200 rushing, first play in the FBS history to do that. He just makes it look so easy right now. And so for me, he is my top. Um, he's at the top of my ballot for Heisman trophy right now. He just makes it look so easy and running up those numbers. And um, I, you know, I think he's going to continue to do that. And we're going to get into conversations about that because there are some questions coming in this week, because there are some power five teams playing G five teams, LSU's one play, play Georgia state. I think Florida state plays an FCS opponent. What to do if you have a Jaden Daniels or you have a Jordan Travis this week, Got some questions coming in from Discord. So, yeah, we're going to go ahead and get into that as well. But first, before I do that, let me get into the four in one Super Fantasy League because we are coming down the stretch. First of all, let's just talk about the overall points leader, Big Boston Man. He, th that team is sitting with about a 200 point cushion with two weeks to play. That is a really good spot to be in. However, Look, the team that's in second place right now, I think, is coming off of a week where they posted a sub 200 point week. So, look, this is wide open right now. Um, I, I there's a long way to go, and when you look at seventh, second, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, I think even seventh place, you've got you've you've got uh, let's see. You've got about six teams within about 70, 80 points for that second place spot right now. So big boss men holding down the top spot as the overall points leader in the, in the, in the, in the total points format, holding on right now behind the teams, Haynes T76, Vegas Killer Clowns, Blackbeard's Delight, Tri Spoke, Leg and Boss, Jason Drab. Uh, those are probably the ones second through seventh that are the closest to grabbing one of those top two spots. But congrats to all those teams making a run right now, really keeping themselves alive, keeping themselves alive in the total points format. Let's go over to the uh let's go over to the 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 head-to-head -head tournament. I think that's the one right now that's really key because we have finalists. We've got the the 73rd seed HK Hot Hot playing the number 14 seed Vegas Killer Clowns. It is a two week final. So, weeks 12 and 13, you will add up your points. The team with the higher score over the course of the two weeks wins. The other team finishes second. So, what does that mean? That means these guys have automatically finished first and second. So, congrats to you guys for being the finalists in the head-to-head -head format of the 4 and one Super Fantasy League. What about the two-halves tournament? Because Rust and Razorbacks have been sitting there for a while, waiting for an opponent in Week 13. Who are they going to face? 
while number 68 seed C Grape FF will play the 59th seed C Money Bobby 44 in the championship of the second half tournament to see who will face Rustin Razorbacks and guarantee themselves a second place finish in the two halves tournament. Now, let me tell you something that's interesting about these two teams. Remember, these teams were reseeded after the first half tournament was over. So these teams were seat reseeded in week seven and C grape FF was the number 68 seed. Remember this, there were only 80 that made it into this tournament. The top 80 teams after the first six weeks made it. This is why I say this tournament, there's a ton of tons of chances to win it. And you're never out of it because this guy was the 60 68th seed after week six, he's now in the position to qualify for the finals against the team that was the number 59 seed. So hats off to both of you guys for really sticking with it. Six weeks into the season, neither one of you guys were, were inside the top 58 teams. You stuck it out. You're one win away from the second half tournament championship and guaranteeing a top two spot in the two halves tourney. And then we we had the total points. We did the head-to-head. We had the two halves tourney. We've got the eliminator. We have, let's see, we have 10 teams remaining. Addy B17, Ain Man, Blackbeard's Delight. That's a familiar name. See Money Bobby 44, another familiar name. Cough Bulls, Go Tigers, Haynes T76. HK Hot Hot, another familiar name. Jawbreaker, Market Zero. U10, congrats to you all. The top five teams, the highest scoring teams this week, the five higher scoring teams in week 12 will qualify for the final in week 13 with the eliminator when the top two teams will take home either first or second. But hats off. And as you guys see, there are some teams that I've mentioned in all of these lists you know, once or twice or maybe three times. So hats off to you guys. We've come a long way this year. Week 12 is finally here. The four-in-one Super Fantasy League has finally played out, and we're down to the end in all of those formats. So congrats to all of you guys. And then, as always, let's get into the Discord questions. We're going to fire it up. I am recording this at an earlier time uh, this week. But you guys, uh, look, thanks for sending in the questions. I've got a lot to get to, so let's just jump right into it. Dylan Gabriel, this comes from John M87. Thanks, John. Dylan Gabriel just put up a 64 burger. Can we trust him to get anything close to 35 points next week? That's your first question. You've got a number of them. Well, here's the deal. Oklahoma plays at BYU this this coming week. Are you going to sit Dylan Gabriel against a BYU team that was just blasted by Iowa State, that would be the question. I don't know if you could really trust anybody on a week-to-week basis. There's no player right now. I mean, look, there's no Barry Sanders in here. Um, it's It's the tricky thing. One bad week can do us all in but you've got to play the percentages. And I don't think anyone's sitting, sitting D- Dylan Gabriel next week on our, in a road trip against BYU. He also asked, is Jonathan Brooks hurt? Is he playable next week? Uh, he looked hurt to me. Didn't look like he'd be playable next week. I think that really does increase the stock for CJ Baxter. Next question. Can we trust players like Quinshot Judkins and LSU starters next week when they play second tier school? Will they only play half the game? Um, Maybe. I have a feeling Judkins is still going to be good for a couple of touchdowns because that's just what the Ole Miss offense does. And look, we talked about it. We're in the middle of a Heisman discussion right now. And I do think it does matter for a guy like Jaden Daniels that, you know, for an LSU team that's sitting on the losses that they have. Sure, it's going to be against Georgia State. But I I still think Georgia State's going to find a way to score some points on that bad LSU defense. And I do think that Jaden Daniels, for sure, is a start this week, along with the receivers in that LSU offense. Is Lincoln Victor worth starting anymore? I think he is. I think you just have to make a calculated risk on 
you know, do, does he fit into your roster this week? What does your matchup look like? I, it's hard to just, it's, it's not as easy as black and white. There's so many factors that play into that. But if you're not willing to roll the dice with them against Colorado, then I'm thinking you've got better options on your bench. And last one, how do you tell a guy in your league he lost due to scoring glitch with Drake May two-point conversion, even though he really should have won LOL? And I remember this one. This was discussed in the Discord uh, server last night. Apparently, you had two-point passes and runs set in the scoring system, but not two-point passes. So Drake May did not get the two points in your league, and that guy wound up losing. And here's the thing. Here's my thoughts on that if you're looking for them. You've played with that setting all year, and nobody's noticed that they haven't gotten a credit for a two-point pass all year. I think it's too late now. You've played an entire season, unless both guys are willing to accept that that's what the scoring should be, then um, – I think you have to stick with the original scoring of the league. I don't, I'm not a big believer in changing rules after the, the league has started. And um, unfortunately I think that's the fate. The guy loses out because the scoring system does not reward two points for a two point pass. And hopefully that's a hard lesson learned for a commissioner and it's never easy to be the commissioner. So good luck with that one, John. Bedtime 37, is there any circumstance in which you would play Joe Milton and company against Georgia? Mm. I don't know if I would. I don't know if I would right now. Um, I don't know what your other options are either, though. So it's hard. Like, again, these are not black and white, yes and no questions, because without seeing the roster, without seeing your matchup, without seeing what else you have available, it's hard to just say definitively, I wouldn't play them. But I would lean on the side of benching him more than I would playing him, depending on what your options are. Bedtime 37 also asks, is Cam Ward back to being a top-tier fantasy option, understanding it's only one week? Well, here's the deal. Again, you have to evaluate your options this coming week. Washington State is playing Colorado. If that's the one that you're willing to pass on, then so be it. Looks good on paper to me, though. If reports come out Braylon Allen is an actually is actually healthy next week, is he a start or do you give it a week? Well, Braylon Allen, Wisconsin would play Nebraska. Just didn't see enough. I think he had three carries this past week. I don't think that I would put my playoff life on the health of Braylon Allen against a decent defense next week. What do you think with Isaiah Williams next week? That's Illinois receiver. Two outstanding performances in a row. But Iowa on tap next week, I think that says it. Again, I cannot definitively say that I would bench him. It doesn't look good, but I don't know what other options you have on your roster. But going against against uh, going against that Iowa defense is never a smart thing to do when it comes to starting a fantasy player this year. I might look elsewhere, but again, I don't know what other options you have. AMC Gow, Gow, AMC Gowan, WSU. Um, if when Genty is healthy next week, is it a split with Halani? Well, look, if he's healthy, uh, I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, look, this goes back to the beginning of the year when you have two good backs and one of them are out, it ra actually helps fantasy owners make a very easy decision. If Genty is back next week, it's going to make things very hairy. I would think for anybody that has Halani right now, the last thing you want to hear is that Ashton Genty is going to play. He also asks, is Tory Horton worth starting or is it time to move on? Look, it's been seven games since Tory Horton has scored a touchdown. The last four, I don't think he's topped the 60-yard mark. They play Nevada this week. Again, you have to evaluate your roster, your matchups, and do you it, it, the, it, the trend isn't great to start Tory Horton right now. But do you have another better option is the question. And which options are they? And you have to weigh those going into this week. Bobby Q. Sauce asks, Jalen Rayner for Arkansas State versus Texas State or Zion Webb, Jacksonville State versus Louisiana Tech? You know, that's a really good one right there. Um, man. Without do doing the projections or really looking at any early weekly ranking 
Top of my head makes me want to go with Zion Webb versus Louisiana Tech. Check back at the projections later on in the week. See how that works out. DCLA asks, is Cedric Baxter a viable college fantasy football playoff starter Is Brook, if Brooks is out? 100% yes, DCLA. Baton Rouge Tigers ask, should we bench Jamari Thrash with his lingering wrist injury? Can't afford another five-point performance in the playoffs. I get it. And Louisville plays Virginia this week, so that's a pretty decent matchup. But it seems like right now that Louisville offense is going through Jawar Jordan and uh, Garendo, the two running backs. They have been vulturing all of that offense for Louisville. They haven't needed to throw the ball quite a bit. They haven't needed to throw the ball a lot. That is not good news for Jamari Thrash owners. Again, I can't say to definitely bench Jamari Thrash because I don't know what your other options and matchups look like but I would have no issue if you benched him for what you felt was a better option in week 12, one in which you need complete clarity and health if you're going to stick somebody into your starting lineup. D Merck asks, do I start Jordan Travis this week against a North Alabama team with a 25% penalty, or should I look at other options? I don't like the idea of taking the penalty with the potential of only playing for half the game. I, you know, look, I get it. This is a tricky one because I don't know. I, I mentioned Jordan Travis for me is in the Heisman discussion. I do think he's still going to get numbers in a half. I mean, look, here's the thing. In order for, for, for Jordan Travis to be out of this game at halftime, Florida State's got to be up 42 nothing, right? If Florida State is going to score six touchdowns, is Jordan Travis going to be good for three to four touchdowns? That's what you have to ask yourself. You have to ask yourself this question in all the matchups. Whenever these really good teams play these FCS schools, particularly if you have an FCS penalty, and that is, well, if they're going to score that many points, they're going to be out of the game early. But if they're going to score that many points, how many is my player going to contribute to? Most of the time, as the quarterback, they're going to contribute to probably at least three of those touchdowns. I would say you're going to get at least three touchdowns out of Jordan Travis. What I'm going to say you're not going to probably get is four quarters. Now, you could get five touchdowns. You may only get two. It's the risk you got to take. And again, I'll say this. It's gonna, I'm going to sound like a broken record. I don't mean to take the high road. But what are your other options? You've got Ewers on the bench, John Rice Plumley. Um, they play on the road at Texas Tech next week. You've got Shador Sanders, who plays Washington State. You got Kyle McCord, who's available on waivers as well. They play Minnesota. I you know, it's a power five only league. I, I could see maybe taking a stab with Shador Sanders against Washington State and maybe going for the upside right there. Um, again, but you've got to be sure. And sometimes you got to ride the guys that get you there. But for a 25% penalty, I would have no problem rolling the dice with another guy if you felt like that you needed to do that. It depends how aggressive you need to be. It depends how conservative you might need to be. I don't know what the lineup looks like that you could potentially play. And I don't know what the rest of your lineup looks like from, from top to bottom. And maybe you just need a 27 point performance from Jordan Travis or do you need a 40 point performance from your quarterback to feel like you actually have a shot this week those are the decisions that you have to take this week uh let's see power five he also asks uh this is D Merck again power five defenses versus lesser opponents what defenses have the best matchups this week I didn't look at the defense defense matchups this week before the podcast I got it in at an earlier time He's like, I'm considering Ole Miss versus UL Monroe and LSU versus Georgia State. Anything else that comes to mind on who's the best option? I'll be honest with you. I would take Ole Miss over LSU. I don't feel good about LSU even against Georgia State. Something inside of me feels like Georgia State's still going to score two to three touchdowns in that matchup. He also asked, any reason to be worried about Ollie Gordon? No, I don't think so. I mean, you're they're going to have a bad game every once in a while. They hit that road, that, that big win against Oklahoma, emotional letdown on the road at, at UCF. They play at Houston this week. I think Gordon will bounce back. Sprague 26. 
He asked, what are your thoughts on Syracuse quarterback slash tight end Dan Valari? He had 17 attempts for 154 yards, two touchdowns yesterday. Do you see him getting some play over the last two weeks? I do. You know, I actually had to research this one a little bit because I wanted to make sure that I could talk about this when moving forward. So I'm glad you asked this question. It looked like the week leading up to the game that they were going to completely change. They wanted to get to this power system on offense. This has been the game plan for them the whole week leading up to Pitt. It doesn't seem like that it's going to change this week. I would actually not hesitate on starting him if you felt like he would upgrade your quarterback spot. He also, Sprague 26 also asked Boston College quarterback Thomas Castellanos. Hard, a hard outing yesterday versus Virginia Tech. To me, his performance has digressed over the last couple of weeks. I think he is still playable versus Pitt this week, but not Miami's in the not Miami in the finals. What are your thoughts? Look, I, playing at Pitt's not going to be easy. Um, I, I even think the matchup against Miami is not going to be easy as well. I, I don't think those are two gimme matchups. Any way you slice and dice it, again, I'm going to ask you. What are your options, though? Do you have better options? It's the calculated risks that you have to take. We understand what the upside is with Castellanos. I don't know what the rest of your roster looks like or how aggressive you need to play it, or do you need to go with another quarterback that you feel gives you a little bit more of a safer floor? Only you can make those decisions based on your roster. But you also asked, looks like TJ Finley got knocked out of the game yesterday for Texas State. If he is out for any length of time, are you comfortable with rolling with Malik Hornsby versus Arkansas State and South Alabama over the last two weeks? I'm going to tell you, no, I'm not comfortable with Malik Hornsby because if Malik Hornsby would have been that good, he would have been the starting quarterback. He's had a number of appearances so far this year, but it's all been heavily run. He doesn't have a single touchdown pass this year. Not only would I not feel comfortable with Malik Hornsby, I would really be uncomfortable with Joey Her Her uh, Hobart, who has been a really good receiver for Texas State, if he's due to play this week and TJ Finley is out. Hobart's are, uh, owners are the ones that I think really have to be concerned this week. Jay Light asks, are Drake Stoops and Tez Johnson all of a sudden must pickups and starts entering the playoffs? Well, look, Tez Johnson, at least six receptions in five straight games. And what? He's got five TDs in the last four games. For me, Tez Johnson is a must start. Moving forward, particularly with the way that Bo Nix has been playing, the way that Oregon offense has looked. Drake Stoops, a little bit more of a, of a question for me. 22 receptions in the last two games. He has caught a TD in three of the last four. But again, they play at BYU this, next, this week coming up. That's a great matchup for Oklahoma. If the hot hand, you know, sometimes you have to play the hot hand when they have really good matchups. And right now, that's a really good matchup for Oklahoma. And Drake Stoops with 22 receptions over the last two weeks. If you're going to go down, or if you're going to put it this way, if you're going to take a chance with a player that maybe you wouldn't have you know, five weeks ago, it should definitely be with a player that's caught at least 10 passes over the last two weeks and has a really good matchup in a very, probably the most important week of the college fantasy football season. Jay Light also asks, is Harrison Whaley trustworthy coming off the last two games? Hawaii is a juicy matchup. I agree. This is a, one of those calculated risks that you have to take. Whaley, you know, hasn't looked great. The numbers haven't been great. But is this a matchup that you're willing to roll the dice? I don't know what your roster looks like. I don't know what your alternatives are. But for me on paper, Harrison Whaley with a really good matchup against Hawaii this week. I could see him being worth the risk to get him into your starting lineup. He also asked Marcus Carroll versus LSU. Got to bench him with how bad the offense has been the last two weeks. This is a tricky one for me because Marcus Carroll has not scored a touchdown in three of the last four games Georgia State has played. And yet I still feel like Georgia State is going to find a way to get into the end zone at least a couple of times, maybe even three against LSU. Boy. Ah, uh, Marcus Carroll has been so good this year. If this was a really good LSU defense, I'd be a lot more concerned 
But man, it's going to be hard to sit Marcus Carroll against LSU because you figure they're going to try. LSU's defense has not been great. Again, I don't know what your other options are, but I can see Marcus Carroll at least being some sort of a flex play on your roster. So that's going to do it. I ran through all the questions in the Discord, guys. So look, that's it. I mean, we are at the most important week in the college fantasy football calendar. Week 11 is over. Week 12 is here. This is the money week. You win this week, you're playing for a college fantasy football league championship. That's going to do it. I'm going to see you guys on the other end of this after week 12. Good luck to everyone this week. Till then, good luck, guys.